Hello to Williams alum everywhere. My name is Ken Aline, class of 1988, and I'm a board certified orthopedic surgeon in sports medicine, practicing in Connecticut and New York City. My practice encompasses some of the poorest as well as wealthiest zip codes in the United States. I've had the honor of serving on the board of a federally qualified health center and currently serve the governor's reopen committee focused on community and health equity the University of Connecticut Health Center, Medical School and Hospital, and chair of the board of the Connecticut Health Foundation, a $150 million foundation focused solely on health equity, access, advocacy, and systems change for communities of color. It is an absolute honor to moderate such a talented panel on a topic very important to me. It is particularly timely that we address these important topics during Black Maternal Health Awareness Week and National Minority Health Week. This panel is one of a year-long series of events commemorating the 200th anniversary of the founding of the Williams College Society of Alumni. Our society is the oldest alumni association in North America and quite possibly the world. We're spending this bicentennial year not only celebrating and grappling with our past, but also examining our present and imagining our future. Together, we envision an inclusive society where all alumni feel they belong. We are united in our shared commitment to a liberal arts education, to lifelong learning, and most especially to each other and to our college. A few reminders though, before we get started. If you have any question during today's talk, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen at any time. We'll have dedicated time for Q&A toward the end of the program, but you can submit your questions as you think of them. Please reserve the chat as a space to engage with the community and share any reflections or comments you may have. Remember to select all panelists and all attendees in the chat dropdown so that your message can be seen by all. Also, please note that we'll be recording today's session. And with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Very talented panel. We are joined by Professor Jalicia Jolly, class of 2014 and postdoctoral fellow and incoming assistant professor in American Studies and Black Studies at Amherst College. Jalicia is a writer and a doula in addition to her academic pursuits. As an educator and reproductive justice practitioner, Dr. Jolly researches and teaches on Black women's health and activism reproductive control and birth justice, and intersectionality of HIV, HIV AIDS in the US and Caribbean. She dedicates her work to anti-racist organizing that advances equity, to improving maternal health, and to elevating HIV AIDS care and mobilization among women in the African diaspora using human rights and reproductive justice frameworks. Dr. Jolly is currently a member of the Massachusetts COVID-19 Maternal Equity Coalition, an interdisciplinary advocacy body that centers the voices of black and brown birthers to develop equitable evidence-based perinatal care. Her work has been supported by grants and fellowships such as Fulbright Scholar Program, Mellon Mays Foundation, Yale, Brown, and the National Women's Studies Association. Welcome, Julissa. Also with us today is Dr. Oge Uwanaka, Williams class of 2016 and an OBGYN resident at Alpert Brown Medical School. Oge Chuku Oge Uwanaka was born in Nigeria and raised in the Bronx, New York. She completed her medical degree at Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston, Massachusetts, where she took a special interest in women's health and learning how to care for underserved populations. She is currently a resident physician in obstetrics and gynecology at Brown Women and Infants Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island. Her impetus for building a career around caring for underserved populations is grounded in her personal experiences growing up in different neighborhoods in the Bronx. She hopes to ultimately build a career as a physician advocate and help carve out spaces for traditionally neglected populations in healthcare. Through intimate and purposeful patient connections, she plans to address issues of health equity, reproductive rights, and disparate race-based maternal outcomes. Welcome, Oge. Finally, we are joined by physician, author, speaker, and executive director at the National Institute for 
for African American Health, Dr. Greg Hall. After graduating from Williams in 1983, Dr. Greg Hall attended the Medical College of Ohio in Toledo and completed residency in internal medicine at the Cleveland Clinic. He is a leader in medical education and a staunch advocate for the elimination of health disparities through targeted policy change, increased funding for urban health research programs, and cultural competency for healthcare practitioners in urban environments and community engagement. In addition to seeing patients in the office and hospital, Dr. Hall is an associate professor with a dual appointment in the departments of internal medicine and integrative medical sciences at the Northeastern Ohio Medical University. Dr. Hall's book, Patient-Centered Clinical Care for African-Americans, a concise evidence-based guide to important differences and better outcomes is the first comprehensive title detailing the optimal clinical care of African-Americans. Welcome, Greg. We are so pleased to have them here with us today. And with that, let's get into the heart of our conversation. Thank you. Greg. Thank you very much. And, and we're honored, I'm, I'm honored to be here with um, such a distinguished um, group. Um, get my slides up. So in a very short period of time, I've been tasked with kind of giving us the, the lay of the land for, um, for health disparities. Um, and so we know over the last year with this pandemic that there's been um, just significant um, suffering and death um, as, as I've seen in my practice here. And too many African-Americans dying from COVID-19 and we've seen the ads from, from month to month from the very beginning um, uh, continuing to this day. And now we're even seeing now as, as the vaccines are, are going and we're closing in on 40% of our population uh, being vaccinated, we're still seeing a disproportionately um, decreased number of African Americans, some of it due to uh, vaccine hesitancy. So the question remains that we need to address is, is racism the cause? And believe it or not, there are people who still don't believe that. And so part of the wondering about the cause is like, what are the tangible things in history that we could point to? And of course, everyone goes to, to the Tuskegee syphilis study, right? And then that's a study well-designed, 600 men, 400 with syphilis, 200 without, um, started fine, but unfortunately targeting specifically African-Americans, but unfortunately took a left turn in 1942, 10 years into the study when the cure for syphilis was available and the participants not allowed to get that and actively sort of actively blocked from getting, from, from getting, that, uh, getting that treatment, getting that cure. And so that went on for another staggering 30 years until um, finally a news article sort of out at them and, and, and the public health officials um, had to finally um, stop this horrific study. And then that study was sort of the beginning of, of just getting public validation of the issues related to it. And so you say, well, that still ended back in the early 70s. Has Tuskegee been forgotten? And there was another study by Johns Hopkins that looked at over 80% 80, 80 of African-Americans were aware of the study and still just under 30% of white people had any knowledge of it. So uh, it's a it, discussion that within black families still occur as it relates to this study. Other historical issues, uh, J. Marion Sims, so-called father of gynecology, uh, basically um, perfected his surgical skills on unanesthetized um, black slaves. And that and he, he was a scientist again. He was impeccable about documenting what he did. So he documented the slave. He was working on the procedure he was doing and, and just horrific uh, without, without anesthesia and one of the most sensitive areas of the, of the body. And so um, the questions of whether he should be a father with all the torture that he put so many people under. I never thought about in medical schools, where do they get uh, cadavers, right? Where do they get the bodies for people to learn to dissection? Well, unfortunately, before modern days, people donating their body to science, it was common to just grave rob, you know, go to the nearest cemetery and where, what cemeteries could you go to where the police probably wouldn't prosecute you? It was in um, um, black and poor uh, slaves, potter fields. And so imagine having your wife or husband uh, uh, die and, and you, you, you had the funeral and the service and everything and you find, go back to visit the gravesite and find that it, the, the body's been stolen and you know who stole it. Uh, those communities know who stole it it was the um, medical school down the street. And as soon as the late 60s in, in Virginia, there was a man who fell off of a three foot wall. He fell off a three foot wall, hit his head, was unconscious, 
Within 24 hours, they had harvested his heart and transplanted it into another man. And so his family knows what happened. His community knows what happened. And so that those issues, these issues that you think are isolated are still sort of um, 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 communicated within those communities. And so the medical science has depended on poor and black bodies in order to, um, to progress. Uh, the American Medical Association back in 2008 finally apologized for its racial discrimination against doctors all across the country. And even back in February of this year, the CEO uh, wrote another article saying they're still trying to deal with the issues related to racism there. Um, uh, redlining all across the country and urban development was, was a, a way to negatively impact social determinants of health. And so um, making some neighborhoods particularly prone to disenfranchisement, to disinvestment. And that's why we have the poverty in areas of, of many cities across the country. So those social and financial advancements also deepen those issues with trust. And so these prior mistreatments have all, they're all in the circle of the families of many, many uh, communities of color. And so when you look at life expectancy, African Americans have the worst at 74, uh, Asian Pacific Islanders combined 86.5. That significant difference is, is what we've been talking about. And when you look at a life expectancy graph and you see um, African American males like myself at the very bottom, um, and that this persists through 2017. And now we've gotten to a point with the release of, of, of statistics in 2021, where we're now seeing a decrease in life expectancy for all, all Americans. And unfortunately, African-American males have, have lost, although they were lowest, we've lost three more years in life expectancy, just going from 2019 to 2020. Hispanic males, minus two and a half. You see non-Hispanic black females, two and a half, and so on there. And so even amongst the, the terrible disparities that we've seen, we're continuing to lose ground. And uh, the pandemic is, is helping with that. But I, as, again, when you think we were all post um, issues related to health disparities, we are not. And so I know I ran through a lot, but I, I wanted to be able to give you a sort of a, a, an overview of um, sort of the lay of the land for this. And now I'd like to pass this over to Professor Jolly. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Hall, for passing that and for providing that really helpful context. I, um, I want to talk a little bit more about Black women surviving three pandemics, um, COVID-19, anti-Blackness, and, and um, maternal mortality. And I also want to lift up the voices of two Black women who recently died because of medical ne neglect and structural racism. Um, and these were these occurred in two different contexts and two different spaces of um, maternal health and COVID-19. So the first is Dr. Suzanne Moore, who is a Black physician who died in December, battling COVID, both COVID-19 and racist medical care in Indiana. And even though she was a doctor herself, she said a doctor ignored her complaints of pain and requests for medical medication, dismissing her cries for help. And shortly before her death, she stated, I put forth and maintain, if I was white, I wouldn't have to go through that. This is how black people get killed when you send them home and they don't know how to fight themselves. And Dr. Moore died on December 20th, a few days after um, she, she circulated this uh, a video stating this um, and she died at the age of 53. So we know that black people die of COVID at a disproportionate rates um, than white folks, right? At 1.5 the rate um, nationally in some counties that's heightened. We also know that black Americans like more are undertreated for pain, not only compared to white patients, but also relative to the World Health Organization guidelines. Um, so eight months before Moore passed away, Amber Isaac, a 26 year old black woman and first time mom tweeted, can't wait to write a tell all about my experiences during my last two trimesters dealing with incompetent doctors at Montefiore in New York City. And her partner said she raised concerns about her care with doctors for weeks. And among these concerns, she learned that she was high risk in February, um, went to give birth in April. But although she was high risk and discovered that in February, she didn't have any office visits in March. And, and that was because of COVID-19. 
Isaac died in the same hospital her mother worked in 25, for 25 years under a doctor she has known since she was a teenager. And this occurred in New York City where we know black women are nearly eight times more likely to die from pregnancy related causes than white women. And Latinx women in the area, particularly Puerto Rican women are face a higher risk of life threatening complications during childbirth. So the deaths of black women like Moore um, and Isaac are more than just sort of these devastating private tragedies, but signal these deep and embodied effects of structural racism, misogynoir and medical violence that are really rooted in a longer history of white supremacy. And these ideas about which bodies matter and whose deaths matter, which pain is valuable and which deaths deserve a meaningful response by a weak public health infrastructure as we're all discovering. And there is deep research and testimonies that show how racism inter interacts with medical um, neglect to degrade how to degrade black women, but also to catalyze their premature deaths. But what is less discussed often that I'm happy to delve into further here with um, with the panel and also with the attendees is the way the sort of less um, it's often described as implicit. I call it explicit bias because it, explicit bias and violence results in this kind of premature death. And nothing ex implicit about this. Um, but what's less engaged and discussed is a sort of psychological and emotional burden, and as well as the physical consequences of this explicit bias, right? That is often manifested in intangible and tangible ways. And so Dr. Tamara Lewis uses the term cumulative deprioritization to describe the ways medical providers make these small decisions about what to do in a moment um, in a sort of, in a medical encounter with a, with a patient, right? Um, and that, that can often lead to black women receiving inferior care. So these actions or practices are not always overt intangible, as I mentioned, but they do build up over time to determine who is valuable and by extension, who is deserving of life-saving care, who deserves more time, who should be um, given less time, um, and we've whose voices should be heard, whose pain should be responded to. And we've seen this, that like the sort of multi maternal health crisis cuts across socioeconomic lines. And we see this in the case of Serena Williams, who talked about um, her pain being ignored during childbirth and how she had to advocate it for herself, literally when she's in a, the most, one of the most vulnerable um, experiences of her life. So again, what is less engaged is this, the way these um, inequities build up over time and how they can shape black women's slow death. And, and this can feel like chronic stress, right? It can feel like physical burden of anticipating racism um, and sexism and medical neglect. And it can also lead to hypertension as well as various other um, illnesses and in chronic conditions. And these are, hypertension is just sort of one of the measurable health risks that stem from structural racism alongside poor neighborhood quality, um, poor neighborhood quality and access to care, mass incarceration and higher unemployment. So a lot of these are structural contexts that sort of mon manifest in the embodied level. And, you know, we'll, we can dive into this later on, but we have a limited time here to, to, to sort of delve into the sort of nature and expansive nature of this. But one of the things that I wanted to mention is that we have been here before, um, decades before the US missteps in our current COVID response outbreak, it laid the groundwork for the racial inequities we see today in responses to HIV AIDS, right? Where there were similar factors that were driving the disproportionate rates of HIV that we also are seeing now in COVID-19. And this includes the lack of economic and social welfare structures with resources to meet basic needs necessary to prolong life, right? Um, we know that because funding for resources and interventions were not accessible to communities of color early on in the HIV AIDS response, um, literally communities had to de develop their own capacity and leadership in order to mobilize and access these basic resources, whether that be tr um, representation in clinical tri trials, treatment, um, having their voices heard, just sort of mobilizing among themselves in order to save their own lives, right? And, and one example of this is literally having black media organizations turning to everywhere to sort of deliver information about HIV AIDS um, on every platform, right? And we also know that the sort of HIV AIDS advocacy um, highlighted the power of community mobilization in countering government inaction and medical neglect in the absence of government action and interventions that addressed um, the racial and gendered health disparities of HIV AIDS. And so, We've seen marginalized communities and particularly black women sort of organize and develop their own efforts to survive amidst illness and inequality. Um, and we see how this were, this was ignored as a part of 
the broader cultural and structural racism has been ignored. This, this broader context that has devalued Black women's bodies and lives and denigrated them and regarded them as disposable. And, you know, we see different aspects of sort of white supremacy unfolding um, as we're watching the, the, the sort of the current trial right now um, um, with George Floyd and, and, and the way in which Blackness is being put on trial itself. And so the last thing that I'll say uh, before passing it over to um, my sister, Dr. Oge, is white supremacy greets us from the medical space to the streets, to the courthouse, and to the classroom. And, you know, racism does operate on a continuum of dehumanizing violence that is rooted in these ideas about who can be seen, who can, what can be heard, um, who can be heard, and, and who deserves to be sort of recognized, whether in life or in death. Thank you. I pass it on. Hello. So thanks so much for that introduction. Dr. Hall and Professor Jolly definitely touched a lot of the things that um, I definitely wanted to cover um, during this time. Obviously, we only have a short amount of time to kind of delve into such a massive topic, but I thought it was important that we are entering Black Maternal um, Health Week, and it, it was important to add this portion to the conversation. So um, Layla's going to be helping me out with the slides so we can go to the next slide here. Um, so basically, I think it's important to define what we mean when we talk about maternal mortality and morbidity. So mortality is specifically pregnancy-related deaths, and that occurs within one year of pregnancy as well as during the actual pregnancy. It can also include um, any events that are initiated by pregnancy or the aggravation of any unrelated condition by the physiological effects of pregnancy. Maternal morbidity refers to excessive hemorrhage, which is defined in obstetrics as greater than 1,000 milliliters, um, hysterectomy, which is the surgical removal of one's uterus, sepsis, eclampsia, which are seizures, heart attacks, and kidney failure and shock. Um, so just here for the raw data, because people like figures, and what does it mean when we say that Black women are dying at a disproportionate rate? So since 2007, since the CDC has been collecting this data and has data for the past 10 years to show that Black women have been dying, as well as um, American Indian and Alaska Native women, at a higher rate compared to their white counterparts. And the um, axis we have here is pregnancy-related mortality ratio. And this means that per maternal deaths, per 100,000 live births, this is the number of women dying split across um, different ethnic groups. So if uh, about 700 um, women are noted to die each year in the US due to pregnancy-related complications, two to three times, um, Black women are two to three times more likely to die um, from these complica complications. Um, we also find that this occurs to, like regardless of the number of pregnancy related um, mortality rates in specific regions. So even if you are in a region that has lower or higher, this um, ratio still holds true and there's still a disproportionate amount of um, Black women dying at this rate. Um, this goes on to say that with age, this also increases. So um, women who are in their 20s to 30s have um, an increased rate of dying as a Black woman, but this only increases as you get into your 35, 40 year range. And this is thought to be, you have, you're at higher risk um, in this um, age frame um, with pregnancy in general, and it's only exacerbated by race. The most important thing I think that the CDC gives us with this data is that a lot of people say, well, uh, maybe they're just poor, or maybe they're just sicker, and that's why they're dying at disproportionate rates. When you control for age, when you control for education level, when you control for socioeconomic status, this still occurs. Black women with a degree still die at a five times higher rate than white women with the same educational status. So obviously there's something else that is accounting for this difference. So what does this mean when we talk about Black maternal mortality? Did this just happen because we started the weeks and are starting to have Black maternal mortality week every year? No. This is a historical legacy that we um, inherited, and Dr. Hall kind of touched on it when he mentioned um, the good Dr. Jane Sims, who is um, known as the father of modern obstetrics and gynecology. Um, he perfected, he, he, he uses, um, a, he created the Sims retractor, which we still use today and still call Sims retractor, and perfected the um, vaginal fistula repair. 
And um, although we benefit from that surgery as an obstetrician gynecologist, we continue to use that surgery. That was, you know, founded on practicing on an unanesthetized black slave women who we do not know if they consented to those procedures or not. There's no, another doctor, Dr. Francois Marie Prevost. He practiced the first cesarean sections on um, black slave women as well. And so again, we can say that we benefited from, you know, being able to say that we can do these surgical procedures and they save lives today, but was it worth the legacy that, you know, that comes with? Um, so, um, Jalicia and um, Dr. Hall kind of mentioned the different concepts around what this means when we talk about why in COVID-19, we're seeing disproportionate deaths in Black communities and why Black women may be dying at a higher rate for different things. Um, there are several theories that people posit, including this concept of weathering, which um, Dr. Professor Jolly also mentioned. So if you have these chronic exposures to social and economic disadvantage, um, disadvantages, that leads to um, accelerated declines in physical health outcomes. So she mentioned hy hypertension, there's diabetes, there's obesity, there's heart disease. This also leads into pre-existing conditions. So if you're going into pregnancy already unhealthy, your chances of you know, faring worse in pregnancy are obviously a lot higher. Um, you're more likely to develop something called preeclampsia, which is hypertension in pregnancy, if you already have chronic hypertension. You're more likely to have gestational diabetes if you already had type two diabetes, um, things like that. So we find that the geographic and um, the geographic and systemic racism that um, communities are experiencing are literally laying the groundwork and setting the frame for all of their experiences when they go into healthcare. Um, and then one point I wanna mention before we kind of move on is that um, there's this idea that we are now medicalizing birth and birth work, which is you know a, a natural process. Women delivering children, giving birth is a natural process. As the field of OBGYN has evolved, it has now, created the system where women are forced into the hospitals, where women used to give birth at home, women used to, you know, give birth at the comforts of, you know, of birth centers safely. And so we've, there's this mass push for women to go into the hospital, which in a lot of cases it's necessary. There's, you know, high risk pregnancies and things like that. But because we're doing this, we are seeing a mass exodus of black women going into a space that they're not, not necessarily prepared to be taken care of the way they need to be taken care of. So, you know, it, for white women, this may not make a difference in terms of having more medicalized births because the system is in place to take care of them, but we don't see that same thing for black women. And so this medicalization of birth and birth work is actually disproportionately infecting and probably one of the reasons why we have this internal mortality crisis in our hands. So there is a shift to like increase black midwifery. We see a shift of doulas and you know, kind of reframing, reimagining what birth is um, and addressing the concept that this is a natural process that we should, you know, um, pay homage to in the way that it was meant to be. Um, lastly, I just want to briefly talk on um, Black maternal health um, in reference to COVID-19 um, in the U.S. So as we were, we were just hearing that COVID-19 has is disproportionately affecting um, black and brown communities. The burden of disease is on these communities because the luxury of social distancing and working from home does not necessarily exist in certain black and brown communities that are, are poor and you're working, you know, certain jobs that don't allow you to do that. Um, there was a prohibition of support people in the beginning of um, COVID-19. So you couldn't, people were giving birth alone. So that means they couldn't have the doulas, they couldn't have the people who were advocating for them in the system that wasn't really built for them. And obviously that would negatively impact their birth experience as well as their outcomes. We were also experiencing shortened hospital stay. I know even at my hospital, there was a push to get people out on postpartum day one or post-op day two if they had a C-section. And if you, if you understand anything about preeclampsia, preeclampsia is a disease of hypertension and it can happen up to six weeks after you deliver. Those first couple of days after you deliver are very important in terms of how your blood pressure is going to trend. And if you're getting out, people out of the hospital in that time period, you're not going to be able to catch um, some of those more dangerous, um, you know, um, you know, side effects of the preeclampsia. And we saw greater readmission rates, greater complications, greater rates of seizures. And then lastly, there was decreased abortion access. You weren't allowed to go to the hospital. DNCs and MVAs, which are the pr medical surgical procedures to you know, perform abortions weren't easily accessible. And that you know, disproportionately affected black and brown communities. 
Um, lastly, I want to just briefly talk about the health practitioner's response in, um, in regards to this. And um, we can talk about this a little bit more later during the discussion portion. But um, so ACOG, which is the governing body of, um, of this obstetrics and gynecology, kind of created this theory or um, policy of the fourth trimester, which really encompasses the postpartum period and making sure that we are paying attention to things like preeclampsia, which you know has a big implication in the the, the postpartum period, we're talk, talking about gestational diabetes and making sure that we are really shifting our focus, not just in pregnancy, but beyond pregnancy, because these are where a lot of the complications can occur. Um, we are risk stratifying with interventions. So women who are at higher risk for preeclampsia, which are black and brown women, people of low income are getting aspirin within the first trimester in order to help prevent preeclampsia. And then this concept of black midwifery and increasing black midwives and um, their training so that we are now recentering and kind of going back to the roots of what birth work and birthing means and, and, and addressing it as a natural process instead of this hyper medicalized and hyper, you know, um, field that pushes women into the hospital if they don't necessarily need to. This is not to be confused with those patients that are high risk and need closer attention and actually need hospital work. So that's all I have. Um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hall and Professor Jolly and we can start the discussion portion of the program. Great. Thank you very much, Ogay. And thank you to our panelists for sharing their reflections with us. We have time for questions and, and we have several, so please utilize the Q&A function. We'll try to be efficient up here um, to make sure we can get through as many questions as possible. I'd like to also call out um, as kind of a, a segue from Ogay's remarks, you know, the study, and I'm sure some of you have seen it, that was recently published of 1.8 million live births in Florida. They looked from, I think, 92 to 2015. Black babies had a three time higher death rate than white babies. But for some reason, when they were taken care, when their initial care was by a black pediatrician, the death rate was cut in half, which is very curious. And, and still we're trying to sort out um, you know, the reasons and causes uh, behind that. But this doesn't end when we deliver, right? It, it continues. And of course, we can then talk about criminal justice and everything else, but we're here today talking about healthcare. Um, we have the first question was, what specific policy or intervention recommendations are there to address the disparities in black maternal morbidity and mortality? And that's from Heather Hatcher. Okay, would you like to start? Yeah, so there's a, several different policies coming up um, right now. So there's this move to um, reimburse the doula. So doulas are currently um, not paid for their work. And it, they've shown that um, the presence of a doula has improved um, Black maternal experiences, birthing experience, decreased the re rate of C-sections, and increased the rate of vaginal deliveries. Um, this work is important. And not having them reimbursed or, you know, financially profit from the work that they do is actually a, a limiting factor to their work. So there's this push and there's um, a couple of bills going around to try to increase um, you know, them having um, a paycheck or a salary for this work that they do. So that's one of the things. I know ACOG has a, a bunch of different, as well as the CDC has a bunch of different um, um, things going out right now to try to improve postpartum care and prenatal care for um, specifically marginalized populations and making sure that they have access, that they get um, telehealth reimbursements and things like that. So there's a, a lot of things in the work right now. Alicia or Greg, anything to add? Um, I think it, it, it is true, doulas do need to be paid. And I think they've, they've, they've been kind of grant covered up in Northeast Ohio where I am and they, they make great impact in, in the rate uh, help, um, the infant mortality rates. And, and that's just basically just having someone who's with you, right? The doulas are normally uh, same race, you know, African-American or, or Hispanic Latino. And so it's uh, someone who's sort of been where you've been and experiences what you experience. And that having that, that sort of support lowers the stress, that stress lowers the um, inflammation and that inflammation increases uh, health outcomes. Thank you. Yes, and I would I would say one of the things that I've been thinking about is um, in, as in my work on the sort of um, the maternal health equity coalition in Massachusetts is sort of ways you can sort of mobilize practitioners, advocates, birth workers, as you mentioned, doulas and midwives. Um, there's just a, a, a sort of broad array of people who are in birth birth work 
whether from a medical perspective, a sort of a interpersonal sort of care, holistic care framework, but bringing them to the table together is sort of interacting and exchanging experience and knowledge base, but also using their different um, capital and power to be able to interact with politicians and policymakers and leaders of hos hospitals, right? Um, I also think centering a patient-centered model of interaction is something that I think can really shape the, interact the medical encounter between practitioners and um, and patients, um, people on the receiving end of, of care. I don't think shared decision-making is always centered in that medical encounter or sort of the need to make treatment um, or prognosis clear or to just sort of offer the range of options that can improve and patient understanding of what is happening or what needs to happen. So I think sort of finding ways to um, think about support and advocacy in a broader framework, um, as well as sort of equipping patients with this, with the knowledge base to empower themselves. And I think, even if patients are empowered and, and advocacy is a tool, I don't think it should be only relied on that because I think there's a sense that it advocates the responsibility of healthcare practitioners and providers to do the work of reckoning with the distrust and the racism that is common um, among patients always, as well as the racism that's common within the medical field themselves. So I think one of the questions that I would later on pose to my colleagues, but also that I'm constantly thinking about is, how do you then shift that labor so that it's not always up on the patient to advocate for themselves? Like, what does it mean to be in the literally most intimate or vulnerable experience of your life, receiving care or, or hoping to receive sort of a dignified ethical care and having to advocate for yourself? In a context like COVID, we know that advocacy looks different, right? Because you can't have um, traditional birth support in the way that you'd want. You have to electronically um, um, come in or you can't have anyone at all, right, for birth support. So I think those are the things, um, those are the sort of interventions that I'm thinking about as well as interested in hearing from you all about what exactly does that sort of system capacity and infrastructure mean to support policy and interventions um, that shifts the burden of that advocacy work away from patients to the people who are providing the care. Thank you. Um, I, I'll remind everyone, please put the questions in the chat, in the, uh, sorry, in the Q&A and not in the chat if you can. So copy and, and paste. Um, you know, one aspect um, of this work in, in this space that is often under discussed in the broader community is the role of the social determinants of health, right? We know that they can impact up to 65% of your health outcome, almost more than the practitioner that you choose or the system that you might find yourself aligned. Can you guys discuss a little bit about your sense or, or your perspective on the role of the social determinants of health in a lot of what we see in regards to inequities and disparities. I'm a ladies first kind of guy, but I've got, you know, I've got an answer. <laughs> I don't want to go first, but, I, but I'll take it. Um, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's huge, right? But it's, it's not everything, right? So, um, you know, I'm probably upper class. I'm, 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 I'm upper middle class, but I'm probably upper class, but I still have those same increased poor outcomes prospects, the same increased risk for diabetes, same increase. So it's not, I don't have the social determinants of health still impact me because I still feel oppressed, right? I still feel like I'm a second class citizen in a lot of the places where I go. Um, but, but, it, but by and large, you know, people who, who, who are, are working in front lines and you know, they have no sympathy for me. And right, and I, so I understand that, that, you know, the social determinants of health are most broadly affecting people as it relates to their access to education and housing and food, right? And, and that's what's impacting, um, you know, greatly impacting health outcomes. And people, if you, if you don't trust, even, you know, when they may trust, my patients trust me, but they still not, they don't, there's still something that's still holding them back. When I say, you know, it's okay to get the vaccine, I got it, or it's okay to, you know, to get any of the vaccines that, that have been proven safe, you know, hepatitis vaccine, you know, that's been safe, it's been out, but people still are hesitant because of the establishment issues. And so some of that's related to education, some of it's related to the lack of, of trust, and some of it's related to continuing bad outcomes. I, we don't have to go back to Tuskegee. I have patients that will tell you what happened yesterday, to what happened yesterday to them that was the most outrageous story you could hear. And it's still happening today. And the, and, the, and the providers probably have no idea what they just did because they're just not rising to their, their level of, of, of notice. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that in terms of when you have a healthcare system that's predicated on the only time that they would take care of black bodies is when it benefited and serve, it, serve them. So when we're practicing C-section so that you can produce more slaves to work, 
that frames how a whole generation of people think about what the healthcare system is for them. It's not there to save them. It's not there to help them. And that, that thinking is passed down through to their children. And so I have 20 year olds, 25 year olds who you would think wouldn't have that same thinking because that's not their generation who still think I, I, I'm afraid I'm going to die in this pregnancy. I've heard those words in the office. I'm afraid I'm not going to make it. And it's like, it's a very jarring experience because I don't even, I can't tell you that you're going to live. I can't tell you that this is going to be a great pregnancy. I can't tell you any of that because I can't guarantee that. You see me in the office today, but I may not be delivering your baby. I, I may not be the person doing your postpartum care. I may, you know, so that variability in, you know, transition from healthcare provider to healthcare provider, that's not, you don't have any safety or security in the system that we have set up today. And I don't know how to remedy that for you. And that's like my biggest struggle with being implicit in the system as a doctor, but also wanting to make change by, you know, I can have these one-on-one -on -one patient interactions that are great, but what is that doing for the community at large? And how am I protecting my patients in the way that I want to? Thank you. Um, next question is from Andrea Park. We know people have been missing routine care and screenings during this pandemic. What's the best way for, help for the healthcare community to reach out to black and brown patients and help them overcome any hesitancy to return to care? And we might wanna to add to that vaccine hesitancy as well. Mm. Well, it's a complicated, it's a complicated uh, issue. Uh, um, some of it has to deal with um, you know, sort of trust. Um, I have patients that are hiding behind the the, the COVID pandemic by for, by not getting screenings that they, they need to get, you know, not getting colonoscopies, not getting their blood. It's just not safe. And they're also not getting the vaccination, right? And so and some of that is is convenience in a sense, quote unquote, convenience for them because uh, they, and, and some of it is, you know, we're spending more time talking about vaccinations and we're not talking about other screenings that, that, um, that patients need. And so, um, you know, the big issue with, with vaccine hesitancy, I think it's getting, the wave is getting, is improving. Um, I think we saw people um, rightfully sort of sitting back and sort of seeing what's, what's the lay of the land, who's gonna get it and what happens to that first group of people. And so I've got my vaccine at the end of December Right, so was, I told my patients, I wanted, I'll be a guinea pig, you know, so you can see. And then, so many of them are getting them. I'm seeing a lot of my older patients now looking for it. Now it's more of an issue of, of, of having having access. So the hesitancy is, is waning, but there are still pockets of, of people I'm worried about in their 20s, African American males, frontline workers in their 20s and, and 30s that aren't thinking about getting vaccinated. And, and I'm, unfortunately, if they do get COVID, it's going to be a sort of a bad outcome. You know, one of the challenges with vaccine hesitancy is also the concept of trusted messenger. And I think there has been a move, at least in the last several weeks, to improve trusted messengers and sorting out how we deliver that message, right? A lot of the people who need the message aren't on MSNBC, CNN, or, or Fox News for that matter. Um, but how do we deliver that message in a, in a responsible and efficient fashion with the right messenger? And, and hopefully that will continue um, as we go through this process to vaccinate the United States. And if I, I, go ahead, sorry, Jalicia. Right, no, go right, go right ahead. No, no, I'm good, go ahead. Um, the, I'm thinking about the reoccurring theme of trust and, and getting back to this. And I always go back to sort of the lessons learned from HIV AIDS pandemic, because I think that's always one that folks think we have made it from with the, with the sort of invention of medical, um, medic, medical sort of um, treatment and advancement in, in, in certain different technology, but it's still affecting disproportionately black and brown folks in the US and globally. But one of the things that was done during, in responses grassroots and national to that pandemic was sort of black physicians, faith leaders and community organizers, as you mentioned, sort of being viewed as trusted messengers during the pandemic, right? Um, and I think that can be one way to adapt in, in, in this response to COVID, but I think what's more important is how to respond to this question about 
What are ways you might validate that shared distrust of medicine and government while also reckoning with the deep history of medical exploitation of black bodies, as you all mentioned, as well as finding ways to sort of drive home the point that, and this is, you know, healthcare and access are still important, right? Getting that routine checkup is, is something that's mindful. And I also want to be mindful of naming the fact that some people are concerned about food and paying their bills and childcare when you have to, when you have to decide between those basic resources and those basic sort of needs, life needs on a daily basis, guess what? Health care and getting that routine checkup is less pressing. And so I think, um, how do you hold both truths while also recognizing people's competing obligations and needs? And I don't think it's something that is always honored in the healthcare space that tends to be focused very much on individualized bodies, as well as how they're situated in their personal and structural context. Agreed. And, and this pandemic was, was a perfect storm for, for so much of that, right? We had the the well-recognized levels of comorbidities within a community with all the challenges of the social uh, determinants of health, this concept of frontline essential worker. It's amazing. The workers that no one saw before <laughs> were relatively unknown were all of a sudden essential, right? It almost has a 400 year context. And you put all that together and you then put layer on top of that a global pandemic and we have this outsized and disproportionate uh, negative outcomes in black and brown communities. Uh, the next question will combine two from Andy Schlosser and uh, my friend Aaron Braden from the late great class of 88. Are there any current federal government initiatives in place or in the works to help educate the general public and address these gross inequalities? Is there anything that you guys are aware um, to help improve the general community's knowledge about these inequities in healthcare. I think now is the time, there are a lot of grants, a lot of, of, of foundations that are really targeting this now. I mean, this, this is the time, if you have a, a nonprofit or, or, or something that, that you're interested in this, now is the time that a lot of the foundations are, are looking to fund things that are targeting specifically um, health disparities and, and ways to sort of decrease them. And so, uh, and, 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 you know, like I said, the, the, the doulas have been funded, but it, it's not validated until the insurance companies pay for it. And the insurance companies have to step up and say, yeah, we do see better outcomes with doulas. We do see better outcomes with um, un underrepresented um, uh, providers. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that universities will start to step up and, and because the, the barriers uh, to, to having the right number of of African American and Hispanic Latino physicians are standardized tests um, that 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 have the special the, the special sauce that share it with some people and aren't shared with others, and that's disproportionately keeping the the, the number of African American and Hispanic Latino visit provi potential providers down out of medical school and then unable to get out of medical school if they get in because of this this array of, 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 of exams that are, you know, I, I don't come to work and take a multiple choice exam every day, right? I come to work to see patients. And so, but, but, the, but the, the portal I have to walk through uh, involves a multiple choice exam. And, I, and that's really blocking out too many people. And we've got to start recognizing, I know some colleges are starting to recognize, you know, how discriminatory it is and are starting to use other options. But I think some of the professional schools the GRE, the MCAT, all those LSAT, they're all African Americans perform the worst on, and they they could do analysis to see why, or, you know, what what are the they do they validate questions, right? You know, is this a good question or a bad question? So they can also validate questions by looking, you know, if you have a whole group of people that are disproportionately missing that question, what is that, right? And so, and is that about is that really still a valid question? So we've got to increase the, the doulas are like. A, a low level provider that are really helping, but boy, if they had a black obst obstetrician, that would be great, right? They had their choice of, of ones that were nearby, that would be better. And so I know I've kind of veered off of your, your question, but, it, but these, are, these are issues that people are paying for. And I think if someone wanted to research the true impact of these discriminatory practices, we could really make a difference. Thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm. Our next question, we will uh, also combine two from uh, Rich uh, Picard and uh, Ken April. What can be done to better train healthcare professionals and students to avoid bias in the treatment of, uh, of patients? And Rick specifically asks, is the AMA or other regulatory medical 
uh, entities requiring uh, these courses for medical practitioners? And if so, how is this being administered? <clears throat> so I think um, this, is, this is a question that comes up a lot. And I think part of the reason that it doesn't necessarily work out is because the institution needs to be one that is welcoming to this change before. So you, if you're training individual, individual healthcare providers or setting out this, we have like surveys and courses that you can do online to get certified and be done with that piece of your training. If your whole institution operates a certain way and allows certain comments in the OR and allows certain comments and treatment of patients on the labor floor and allows certain things, your training means nothing in the system because the system is built to perpetuate um, this type of behavior. And it's a lot of it is just a culture of like, we've done this thing the brown way for 50 years and we're gonna continue to do this, this, you know. So training individual providers doesn't really do much in terms of the culture that is allowing these things to happen. So I think it needs to be an uproot and uh, an accountability. So if you hear something, there needs to be a system to report it and people can't be protected by unions and people can't be protected by, um, you know, this idea of like, we've done this the same way forever. So I think a lot of this, we kind of put the onus on, oh, well, medical providers need to get implicit bias trained. That's true. However, if they then go and train at an institution that does not support them in their implicit bias training, then we're not really doing anything. So I think um, the, 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 the culture now needs to shift after we've done all this training, it needs to shift to how are we making sure these institutions were deconstructing those types of biases within the actual institution. Yeah, it's, it's certainly an institutional context and it needs to be top down. Um, but when the leadership doesn't support, you know, the, there's a lot of lip service obviously done to this sort of training to check a box or to allow a foundation grant to come through, but rarely do you see it enforced um, to your point okay, throughout the, the institution in any sort of meaningful way. And in addition to the lack of follow-up that you both mentioned and sort of sustainability of these kinds of accountability mechanisms, it seems like there's a dishonesty and overarching dishonesty that makes it unlikely that people will name the elephant in the room that when we, when we mentioned the need for training and impl implicit bias, which I don't believe in, it's explicit bias, bias that is resulting in violence, right? There's a dishonesty about the fact that we need to name sort of that there's white supremacy and ra racism that is operating in medical practices that is literally shaping who gets to survive and who will die. And I think because of that, th there seems there, there's, there's not an ability to sort of create the in interventions that are tailored to the direct systemic um, issues that are at hand, right? Um, and I know that's, that's hard. It's hard to legislate or create a policy that shapes, um, that shapes a medical encounter, right? that shapes one's minds or what's inside one's heart. But I think that is, um, that is, I think that's where it starts is one naming honestly that, you know, there's, there's a culture in which peers are socialized in order to operate and to give medical care in very anti-Black ways. And what does that mean if we are socializing the next generation through our curriculum, through our trainings, through our, um, you know, sort of the way we, we, we interact on a sort of institutional organizational basis to deliver that care in such, in such ways that are dehumanizing. And I think once, that addre once that's addressed, I think we can have a more direct um, converse, you know, honest sort of ways to implement this work. But I don't think implicit bias trainings are the way out. I see those happening right now. They're happening in higher education contexts. They're happening in medical contexts. They're happening in business contexts. And what has been the sort of ramifications, not that they're completely irrelevant, but there's, there's, a, there's a lack of desire to name the concrete bodily effects and impacts that anti-Blackness and white supremacy is having on patients, on educators, on providers, on everyone involved in this medical encounter. Thank you. And, you know, interesting is also not a part of assessment, right? We, we, don't, we don't assess our uh, physicians or our providers in any way on any form of cultural competency. We assess them on a, a lot of other metrics, but that's not, that's not one. And I think until it, it somehow plays into the bottom line, you know, that motivates a lot of behavior. I, I think it's gonna to be tough to change. They actually try to, um, at least where I went to medical school, there's a curriculum for that now. But again, there's a curriculum. I, I just, I don't know what the result is. So I think that there's a lot of good meaning and work behind it. And so we do have a, con a cultural competency thing that we needed to check off before we graduated, but <laughs> I don't know what that did. So it's, it's something I'm also struggling with. 
Absolutely. And, and as we exit those trainings into institutions that don't respect it, what's the, you know, to your point, right? net, net, we're not positive. Um, <laughs> we, we have, uh, I think we have, we have time for one more. We've had some really great, excellent questions. I wish we could answer all of them because they're, they're really good. But this one was, was very compelling. The next one up from Kate Phipps Arif. Do you think that a social health system would potentially have some impact on solving some of the disparities in healthcare beginning with access? This is the age old question. If we yeah. had a, a government based uh, system of care like many uh, industrialized economies around the world have, how would that impact access? And do you think that would impact outcome? Or just oh, there's different, you know, there are different issues. Um, uh, you know, so it's just like we're talking about this implicit bias training and access, and it's still all it still doesn't address the, the the people that are still getting care in front of people and saying, you know, I just had a bad encounter with a provider, uh, I don't trust this person, and so I think it would it you know the um, you know Affordable Care Act um, really decreased the number of people I had to see for free. You know, it really did. And it hasn't solved everyone in all parts of the, of America, but I haven't had it someone with no insurance sort of in a while. And so access has improved, but it's this this next issue that, you know, sort of like rather than, rather than, you know, there are people that don't believe in racism. There are people that don't believe racism exists. They're, you know, they just, no, there's, there, we, we don't have a dis, African Americans don't have a disadvantage. The Spanquitillos do not have a, a disadvantage. People believe that still. And when you've got it, and it's, a, it's not a small number, they may not out themselves by telling you that, that, that but they, it's not a small number. And, that, and those are the people that say, you know, I treat everyone the same. I just treat everyone the same. That's the most dangerous provider you could come to actually believes they, they treat everyone the same. And so um, I, it, it's again, it, you know, access would be great. We want everyone to have access, but we also want people to know that they have biases they need to address that, that they have racist tendencies. They need to address those tendencies that they have and try to compensate them. And if, if you try to overcompensate, you know I, I'm racist, therefore I'm gonna try to go out of my way to give better care to this person because I know I have these racist underpinnings. And so that's what we need to, to try to get to that, that next level, I think. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think, um, the concept of like the social, I think it is a great idea, obviously, but it doesn't really address that our, our country doesn't treat everybody the same and human beings, we're not all human beings in the eyes of the law in the eyes of the government in the eyes of our healthcare system. So yes, we can create access and increase access, but the idea that my body is not the same as someone else's body does not change because that system is in place. And I think that's been shown when we have you know, highly educated black women dying of the same pregnancy causes as, you know, their lower income counterparts. So will that change because we have, not everybody has healthcare? I don't think so. Yeah, we have to um, divorce access from the issues of disparities and inequity. Um, when you look in many of the socialized democracies, look at the UK, you know, their registry show tremendous inequity in a system where everyone has access. Um, you know, so uh, you know, we cannot uh, divorce race from the healthcare interaction. And it absolutely has to be intersectional, right? Because we know that this is racialized and gendered, right? And I think <clears throat> when I think about Black maternal health needs, when I think about maternal mortality, when I think about maternal morbidity and all the sort of details that Dr. Oge just went into about the sort of the effects and, and, and the history of gynecology and obstetric care and its present, you know, I, I go back to the 1965 Moynihan report, right? The, the, the sort of Negro family, the case for national action, where um, this high up level d official, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, talked about the social inequities in the country, but blamed Black women's childbearing on that. And there's ways in which these ideas are still dominant, they're still divining in American policymaking and in interventions and in public health and the way that we're considering and, and approaching many of these problems. And so when I think about when I think about the sort of racial inequities, right, that, that, that Black women are experiencing as they're making life, as they're sort of um, in spaces where they're expecting, well, no, not expecting, but um, hoping providers would treat them like human beings, um, I think about the sort of enduring effects of a report like the Moynihan Report and the ideas that are propagated that, that sort of are degrading 
um, of Black women's bodies, but also are framing them as literally the scapegoats for social inequities, for for all of the, um, the, the societal illnesses, right? And so literally from the womb, they're framed in, in these problematic ways. And so of course, it, it's not shocking to me that then in the space where Black life is being made <laughs> um, in a birthing experience, while their needs, their, this, their birthing process will not be prioritized in the same way that a white woman's birthing process will, because white women have not historically been framed as the sort of source of this degeneracy. And so I know his, you know, history is in the present and it's living and it's alive in all of our bodies and in these sort of inequities that we're seeing. But I also, you know, I also wish there was a way for this to be I don't know if it's more education. We can educate our way out of anti-blackness and, and white supremacy, sure. But as we can saw, as we saw from last summer when there was a bunch of reading recommendations on the things you need to read to get educated. But I think it needs to go beyond edu education, which is why I'm okay, yes training. But there needs to be more and a different kind of way that we're framing the conversation, as you mentioned, um, okay, about um, the, what the larger context is and what's still being reckoned with and what we have not yet reckoned with, um, which is why we can't deal with the fact that where um, um, certain bodies, certain lives and certain deaths do not matter and that is shown. Thank you. And I wanna thank you to our panelists. We have so many questions and we could easily spend <laughs> another hour plus discussing um, these very important issues and very timely issues. I'd like to thank you to our panelists for sharing their reflections with us. Um, certainly if you have any sort of last uh, comment that you'd like to make, that would be wonderful. But if not, um, we are two minutes over and I promise that we would be on time so people could finish their lunch and get back to their next Zoom. Um, please. Yeah. And I want to lift up the work of those in our community who are doing this for justice work. I want to lift up Kelia in my class of 2014 doing this work as a doula in LA in, in California. I want to lift up Savannah Brown, who's in class of 2015, who's working as a doula. Um, there's a bunch of people who are in obstetric care also in Oge's class um, who are doing this work. I can't remember all of their names now, but I, I want to note that there are people in our Williams community who are invested in this work, and I hope we can continue this conversation in different spaces. Thank you. And just a reminder, there are more conversations, workshops, and programs as part of the Society of Alumni Bicentennial throughout this year. We'll help you engage as you're able, and thank you for joining us. Take care and be well.